totally nailed it. What's up, everybody? My name is Anders. I also have the privilege of co-leading the Young Adults group. So if you're a young adult in the building, screw it. We had so much fun yesterday, for real. And also, uh, shameless plug, we are headed to Frisco, Colorado, August 19th through 21st for a Young Adults retreat. So sign up for the retreat. We're going to have a great time hanging out, loving Jesus together in Jesus' name. Uh, I want to say just real quick, thank you so much, Rob, and the executive team for this opportunity to be here to hang out with you guys today. So honored, so humbled. I know I've done nothing in my life to deserve to be able to study the Bible with you guys, uh, but happy to be here with you. So thanks so much, family, for, for this opportunity. Uh, we have been in a sermon series uh, called The Book of Mark. Yeah, I know, super glamorous, super flashy, uh, but we are going through the book of Mark together. We are focusing as a church on studying the Bible, on practicing digging in to the scriptures and trying to get as much as we can out of it. And so next Sunday will actually be our last Sunday in this sermon series. Uh, but if you've been following kind of the reading plan that we have, we've been kind of taking two chapters each week and just digging in and saying, okay, Jesus, what do you want us to learn from this? So this week's chapters, quote unquote, are Mark chapters 13 and 14. Uh, and so we're going to be just be taking a little bit of a look at that today. But before we get into that, I wanted to share with you some of my most exclusive, amazing, helpful Bible study techniques that I've incorporated over the years. Are you guys ready for this? Uh, this is a great, you can take notes. You can use these techniques for yourself. They're not just mine. You can use them too. And maybe some of you already have, right? Uh, the first one, is, I like to call it the magic eight ball. Right? It's when, you know, the magic eight ball, like you needed an answer for life and you just shook it. And it's like, should I date this girl? And it's like, ask again later. And you're like, well, not so magic, Mr. Eight Ball. Right? But we do this sometimes with the Bible. We're like, God, I just really need to know if I should quit my job. And then it's like we look at the verse of the day on our Bible app, and it's like, and Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And you're like, God, are you speaking to me through that? Or, right? So that's the magic eight ball. Feel free to use that if you want. The other one I like to do is using the Bible to, like, prove my own personal preference. Have you ever done that, right? Log on to Google, and you're like, what does the Bible say about being nice to your husband? Email that to my wife, right? No, <laughs> it's so messed up. But a lot of times we do that. We're like, well, I want to know more about this. And so we try to do the topical search, which has its ups and downs, right? But my personal favorite, and maybe you've done this before, my personal favorite Bible study technique, I like to call it the pray and lay, all right? First, first step, take the Bible. Second step, pray. Lord, give me that word today. And then the third step is the lay. Psalm 7, a shigion of David, which he sang to the Lord, right? And then we try to pull things out of it. And hey, listen, if God's spoken to you in that way, I believe he can do it. That's awesome. But hopefully you've been learning with us through this process that there are actually some great strategies, techniques, and tools you can use to study the scripture. And one of my favorite things to do when I'm trying to learn from the Bible is simply to ask questions. Does anybody else like to do that? Right? And you've seen it. It's in our study guide. We've, it's just a list of a bunch of questions for you to reflect on, right? Who, what, when, where, right? It, things like, how did this happen? What was Jesus doing? Who was involved? Who was this passage written to? And a lot of times, those types of questions establish a context with which we can better understand the purpose of the text, right? But my absolute favorite question to ask when I'm reading the Bible is why? Who, what, when, where, how, those all establish context, but the question why helps us to draw purpose out of the scripture. I do believe that this is profitable and useful for the teaching and the correction of you and I. Because I know on my best day, I'm a terrible person, and I need this in my life. So when I have the belief that the scriptures contained in here are good for me, then I can ask the question why. I'm not questioning God saying, why would you do this? I'm using the question why to say, God, why is this in the Bible? Jesus, why did you say it this way? Why was it organized like this? And believing I can draw then purpose out of it for my life. So 
there's no way we would have enough time to cover all of Mark 13 and 14, so we're definitely not going to attempt to do that today. But I invite you to join me today as we just take a look at Mark chapter 14, and we're just going to ask a big why question, okay? And, and the question why has a lot to do um, today with the structure with which John Mark, the author of Mark, wrote Mark chapter 14. So, but let's put it into a little bit of a context, okay? Mark 13, the disciples and some people kind of ask him, like, what's the signs of the end times? Like, when is all this stuff going to fall apart? And so Jesus spends a ton of time in Mark chapter 13 talking about the signs of, of the end times. And then in Mark 14, if you read it, you notice it's like a passage that talks about a lot of these little events that lead up to the big event, right? To the, the arrest, the death the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Christ. So Mark 14 is kind of like this, it's a pretty big deal of a chapter because it's leading up to the most hell-shattering, earth-shaking, history-dividing moment of all human history, right? And so John Mark years later sits down and says, I'm going to write this so generations can, can read it, so people with different languages can understand it. Now, I don't know about you, but if that was me, if that was my job, like, Record the things that happened in a way that someone in another country thousands of years later could still understand it. I'm writing that thing as clear as possible, right? Like, fact one, Jesus went here at this time. Fact two, Jesus said this to this person. Fact three, this exact thing happened. Like, I'm writing that script like a documentary. Does anybody out there like documentaries? My dad loves documentaries. I remember as a kid, like, we would, I'd like, it's like movie night, and I'm like, yes, let's watch Toy Story. And my dad's like, wait, there's a documentary of, about whales on tonight. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool, Dad. Like, we can watch a documentary about whales. Uh, no, but if you, documentaries lay out the facts because they want to make this thing clear, right? But when you look at John uh, and Mark chapter 14, it's not really laid out as clear as fact one, fact two, fact three. In fact, the way the author structured it, it's a lot more relational. Like, it has a lot more to do with how Jesus interacted with his disciples and the relationships they had with one another. So the story still gets told, but it's through this lens of all these kind of side stories and dramas. Like, it's a lot less documentary and a lot more soap opera. You know what I'm saying? Like, for my Latino friends, like, telenovela más dramática. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's like, por qué Dios? And it's like... So Jesus said this, and Judas got offended. So Judas sold out his best friend, but then he still showed up to dinner that night. And Jesus said, did you just sell me out? And Judas said, no, I didn't sell you out. And then Peter's like, God, I would die before I sold you out. And Jesus was like, you're going to sell me out tonight, Peter. And he's like, no, if everyone else falls away, I would never deny you. And then Peter falls asleep and cuts off a dude's ear. Like, it is so much drama. Drama! Telenovela! Anoche en Telemundo, right? Okay. Jeez. Lord have mercy. So that's, that brings me back to my big question of why. John Mark, why did you write it like this? It's the precursor to the biggest historical event of all history, and you included all the dramatic details. He told it through the lens of how Jesus interacted with his disciples, specifically two of them. We talked about it just a second ago, Judas and Peter. No other disciple is really mentioned except for the one who fled naked at the end of the chapter, which is just unnamed but weird. <laughs> but Peter... And Judas. And so today, in the effort of studying the Bible, I just want to take a look at all the times Judas is mentioned and all the times Peter is mentioned and see, hey, what can we learn from this thing? Another literary technique being implored here is called juxtaposition, right? It's when an author takes two things and places them in parallel or side by side, and then from the similarities between the two or the differences between the two, the author communicates a specific point. So let's assume that John Mark was telling this in a way to, ju uh, to juxtapose Judas, his relationship with Christ, and Peter and his relationship with Christ. So I brought a little chart. We're going to school because this is Bible study, okay? We're going to school. So I'm not going to read all of these scriptures because that's a lot. 
and you guys can read them on your own. But I'm going to summarize some things that happen with each of these disciples. So first, we'll start with Judas. In Mark 14, 3 through 10, a woman comes in and she breaks a, a jar of expensive perfume. And it says some of the disciples were indignant and they said, why this waste? This was worth a year's wages. We could have sold this and the money been given to the poor. Now in Mark, it doesn't specifically say that Judas said this. It says some of the disciples. But when you read the very similar story in John, which some scholars believe are the same story, that word for word phrase, why this waste? This could have been sold, the money given to the poor, was directly attributed to Judas. And the other reason we believe it was Judas was because in verse 10, when you read it, it says after Jesus said, stop, this woman's done a beautiful thing and kind of rebukes the indignant disciples, Judas leaves and he sells Jesus out. So when you're learning something really good from a friend, you're not thinking I'm going to go sell you out. It's when you're offended, right? That's it, Jesus. I'm gone, right? So I just wanted to make that side note to make sure that that's why I drew the conclusion that Judas was one of the indignant disciples. Then in Mark 14, 17, it's the Passover meal. Jesus looks at all of them. It says all the 12 were there. And he says, will, will you betray, or one of you is going to betray me. It says one by one, so that would include Judas. They all looked at Jesus and said, surely not I, Lord. Right? And then in Mark 14, 44, it says that Judas arranged a signal with the guards. He said, the one that I kiss is the one you should arrest. And so Judas, when you kind of just summarize his outward external actions in this chapter, he seems to care for the poor. He proclaims his loyalty to Christ. And then he kisses Jesus. All these things seem kind of good. Now let's take a look at our friend Peter on the other side of the board. Mark 14, 29 through 32, Jesus is trying to say, you're all going to be scattered. This is going to happen. And that's where Peter gets really romantic. And he's like, surely, Lord, I would never do that. And he's like, Peter, listen, you're going to deny me three t times tonight. And Peter's like, I would die before I deny you. And so he's like kind of being prideful and stubborn. Jesus is trying to tell him something, and he's not listening because he's, he's, he's too stubborn. Then in Mark 14, 37, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter, James, and John go to pray with Jesus. Jesus comes back, and they're all asleep. And Jesus actually in Mark 14 rebukes Peter directly for it. He says, Peter, Simon. He says, Simon, because that was his name before. Couldn't you just stay awake and pray? So he falls asleep on Jesus. In Mark 14, 47, we reference this. They come to arrest Jesus, and it says one of them among, him, among the disciples drew a sword and cut off a, a servant's ear of the high priest. And the other gospels say very clearly that this was Peter. It was not just one of them. It was Peter. Mark 14, 54, then Peter follows Jesus, who's been arrested, into the town, but starts to put a distance between him and Christ. And then finally, that distance accumulates in Mark 14, 66 through 72, with Peter denying Christ. So let me just ask you this question. If we're just practicing juxtaposition, and you're just looking at the external actions of these disciples, which one of them was the better <laughs> disciple? The one who cared for the poor? Proclaimed his loyalty and kissed Jesus? Or was it the one who was prideful and stubborn, who fell asleep, who cut off someone's ear, who followed Christ at a distance and then finally denied ever knowing Christ? See, it's hard for us to view that through simply the actions because we know the full context. We know Judas betrayed Christ. We know that while he was doing these good things, he betrayed Jesus. But man, if we were in the moment and we didn't have the advantage of the hindsight as 2020, Judas would have looked like a great disciple. And in fact, he was. When Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, it's not like the other disciples were like, oh yeah, it's Judas for sure. We saw this coming for a long time. Like, no, all of them were like, surely God, it's not me. It was this whole mystery. So Judas mostly does and says all the right things. But his heart was in the wrong place. He was able to do all the Christ-like things while his heart was in the process of selling Christ out. And Peter mostly does and says all the wrong things, right? But his heart seemed to be in the right place. Did he cut off a dude's ear? Yeah, probably not the right move, Peter. But it's because he wanted to defend his Savior, right? Was he being stubborn in his response to Christ? Sure, but it was out of faithfulness for him. So what's similar about these two disciples is that there's a gap. There's a gap between what they actually did and what their heart intended to do, right? The difference, though, between them is that Judas, his heart was wicked and selfish and had selfish motives, 
but then the gap was that his actions were good. Peter's gap looked a little different. His actions were awful. Oh, my gosh. But in the center of it was a heart that truly was surrendered and wanted to be a disciple of Christ. So I think when we put these things close together, we can then ask, why? Why? What are we supposed to learn from this? And I believe that through this chapter, and there's a lot of things that you can learn in this chapter, but just through this practice, we can learn that there's two different ways we as Christians respond to the call of discipleship. Both of them said yes when Christ said, come follow me. But now three years later, kind of their Christian walk with Christ was coming to an end or at least coming to a big pivotal moment. And they both responded differently. So if we are here and we're like, hey, I'm trying to follow Jesus. I want to be a disciple of Christ. We can now look at this and say, oh, shoot, I might relate to one of these stories or the other. So the first way that Christians respond to the call of uh, discipleship is there's the Christian who changes their behavior but doesn't surrender their heart. That's Judas. And I think it's a lot of the, of the church, especially the American church. We have become addicted to altering our outside behaviors without ever actually feeling convicted to change and surrender our hearts. Right? What, what do I mean by that? I mean, like, if you look solely at Judas's external behaviors, he seemingly did all the right things. He would be like the, the dream leader in the engaged team. Like, what? You care for the poor? Come on, man. Like, join the engaged team. Like, he did all the awesome Christian things. He was as good of a disciple as any of them. But this person models Christ externally without ever fully surrendering internally. And this is usually because those positive behaviors, we adapt them because of some sort of pressure, right? We want to fit in. It's culturally right to do this. My parents put this pressure on me. Like my daughter right now is in a stage where if she does something wrong and I go and confront her about it, she'll be like, but dad, you didn't see me do it. Like I know she's got chocolate all over her face, but you're right. I didn't see you eat the chocolate. But I know you did it. But because she's learning the difference between just doing something because I'm around versus doing something because it's something I've asked her to do. You see, there's a difference in doing the right behaviors when it's convenient, when it helps you fit into a church, when it's what your parents asked you to do. There's a difference between that and then actually doing it because you feel that ownership and that conviction in your heart. So it's... uh, But when it all comes down to it, that person, the Christian who changes their behavior but does not surrender their heart, uh, when it comes down to it, their personal will is still on the throne of their heart. Maybe they have hidden sin patterns, right? Uh, Maybe uh, they ignore the parts of the scripture that confront their own personal preferences. Guys, we have so all done this. I was the kid in high school who like was like trying to learn guitar on the worship team and lead a small group. But then when I was in my at church, but then when I was in school, I was being a total idiot and pretending like I had no idea who Jesus was. Why? Because the behaviors of Christianity only benefited my image in certain circles. But when left to myself, I was quick to do whatever was sitting on the throne of my heart. It says in John, when Judas complained about the money, it said, it, he, did, he said this not because he cared for the poor, but because as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was in it. So though he portrayed externally all the good actions of a disciple, he was secretly fostering a sin of stealing. And what did Judas end up selling out Jesus for? Money. Sadly, this form of discipleship is often embraced and celebrated in the church today. I mean, it is. Why? Because we love hearing the story about the person who used to cuss, but now they don't cuss anymore. The person who used to steal, but now they don't steal anymore. Right? The person who used to be this way, but now they're not that way. Listen, that is a form of discipleship. In fact, I would say true discipleship eventually does lead us to changed actions. But sometimes when we blow up the place of changed external reaction actions, we actually create a hollow form of a discipleship that ends up having no substance at all. So when the rubber hits the road and the people who care about our actions aren't looking, we're quick to crumble back to exactly who we used to be. And this is exactly what happened with Judas. This is, this is the same issue that the rich young ruler had. 
He said, God, I've kept, he said, Jesus, I've kept all of those commandments since birth. I've done all the things I was supposed to do. So Jesus said, then go sell all you have and come follow me. And he walked away sad. Why? Because on the throne of his heart was still his love for money. This was the problem Jesus had with all of the Pharisees. They had mastered every part of the religious law. And Jesus like, Pharisees, you, you care only about washing the outside of the cup. He looked at him and he said, you guys are like whitewashed tombs, clean and pretty on the outside, but dead on the inside. He looked at him, he said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. You honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. And this is me. I've been that Christian so many times. So that's the one response. That's the Judas. The other response we tend to take on as Christians to the call of discipleship is we become the Christian who has genuinely surrendered their heart, but has not allowed that surrender to bleed out into our behaviors. Right? This is the Peter. It's the person who's chosen to submit to Christ and surrender their personal will, but those messages, those teachings, the lifestyle of Christ has not transformed our external thoughts, speeches, behaviors. I mean, based on Mark 14 alone, Peter was a pretty rough dude, <laughs> right? And we, it makes sense. I mean, Jesus called him out of what? Out of this kind of rough, tough industry of fishing. He said, drop your nets, come follow me, I'll make you fishermen, all that stuff. And so Peter immediately surrenders his will. He said, okay, I'm leaving my will behind. Let me become a fisherman. But gosh, maybe he was 18 years old at the time. I don't know. No wonder 18 years of a certain habit didn't get changed the moment he surrendered to Christ. And I think a lot of times we beat ourselves up for this, right? We're like, man, I'm trying to be a Christian now. Why are these actions, why are these habits, why are these things still coming out of me? Why do I still get frustrated? Why am I still dealing with anger? Why am I still grumpy towards my spouse? Well, you were a grumpy person for 25 years before you met Christ. <laughs> So what makes you think the one prayer, which is important, the salvation is important, is I'm automatically going to undo some of those behaviors. No, Christ is not threatened by the process that it takes you and I to get to him. He's not threatened by it. He wasn't threatened by it in Peter. Peter was this rough dude who was still chopping off people's ears. And Christ said, no, you're going to be one of my three closest. Not only that, I'm going to build my church upon this rock. So isn't that good to know? Like the work of Christ in our hearts, when our hearts are surrendered, it's not threatened by our actions that are still getting worked out. So even in the midst of Peter's imperfect actions, Jesus still worked with him. And he wants to work with us today. Guys, this is not a bad part of the process. I think it's a necessary part of the process. It starts with surrendering our heart. But if we just leave it at that, we're not really being disciples of Christ. But Jesus is not threatened by that. So what's revealed to us when we kind of put these things close together? True lasting discipleship is not evidenced by how well we can alter our behaviors. It's just not. Anyone can change their behaviors for a season. But it takes a surrendered broken heart to change your behaviors for a lifetime. It's evidenced by how well we can surrender our hearts. Perhaps this is why Jesus said the most important commandment is love the Lord your God with all your Heart, soul, mind, in some other gospels, strength. Why was the heart listed first? Because Jesus was trying to communicate when you surrender your heart, when you say, Anders, you are no longer the God of your life, Jesus Christ is now the Lord of your life, when you start there, eventually it bleeds out into every other area of who you are. When we focus only on changing our actions like Judas did, we tend to close the gap between our heart and our actions through self-justification. We say, well, I know I'm still dealing with lust, but at least I'm serving at church. We say, I know I'm still being mean to my spouse, but at least I read my Bible once this week. We take our external actions and we use them to reduce the cognitive dissonance we're experiencing with the fact that who we claim to be is not lining up with who we actually are. And as Christians, we perpetuate the stereotype that all Christians are hypocrites. Why? Because we put so much emphasis on that external action. But when you focus on surrendering your heart, that gap between inside of you and the outside of you is shrunk by something called conviction. Conviction. We're going to read this real quick, our scripture in Mark 14, verse 72. 
It says this. So this is where Peter's like kind of getting called out and he's denying Jesus. In 72, it says, immediately, everyone say immediately. Immediately. The rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And Peter did what? He broke down and wept. He didn't justify it. He didn't say, well, the little girl was pointing at me. Well, the guards had sharp spears. I didn't want it. No, he realized it and he broke down and wept. This holy conviction, this godly sorrow, it's mentioned in 2 Corinthians 7.10. Godly sorrow brings about repentance that leads to life, but worldly sorrow leads to death. That's what Peter encountered. When your heart is surrendered, you open up the doors for the Holy Spirit to help you decide what is right and what is wrong. It's what Jesus said. He said, it's better that I go away because I'm going to send a helper. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness. That is the greatest gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to try to decide what's right and wrong. When we surrender our hearts, the Holy Spirit leads us in that. And in that moment, Peter denies Christ. And suddenly, he realizes the gap between who he claimed to be and who he was actually being. He was transported back to the Passover meal table, sitting across from Jesus, where he was saying, I would never deny you. That rooster crowing moment, the conviction of God, is one of the greatest gifts we can ask for. The work of Christ that began years earlier when he called him out of fishermen, of being a fisherman, was now being completed through his actions via what? Conviction. So what do we say about Judas? Well, certainly it was prophesied that Jesus would be betrayed in this way. But if we just if we if we hold that on a shelf but wonder, did Judas ever have the opportunity to also be convicted? I think the answer was yes. And in fact, it was at the exact same dinner table where Peter just got taken back to. Jesus sat with his disciples and he said, one of you is going to betray me. And Judas and Jesus knew who it was. And Judas, instead of hearing that rooster crow, instead of feeling that conviction, Instead of realizing this was his opportunity to portray a broken, surrendered heart, instead of breaking down and weeping bitterly, he chose to look at Christ in the eyes and say, surely, not me. Not me. And I think those two decisions, to me at least, are the summary of how your discipleship walk with Christ may go. We can choose to be the people that says, God, surely you're not talking about me. Look at all the things I do for you. Jesus even said at the end of the world, in the end times, many will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things for you? And he said, depart from me. I never knew you. So here we're going to end today's service with communion. Because that's what happens in Mark 14. They're sitting at the table. But one other literary note before we jump into communion. Notice where the communion passage is placed in this passage. It's sandwiched between Judas looking at Jesus and saying, surely not I, and Peter claiming that he would never deny Christ. And I think the placement of that is everything. Why? You might be in the middle of your biggest blunder of your life, but you're still invited to the table. Maybe everything is great right now and your biggest sin or your biggest fallout is coming in the future. I pray that's not the case, but that was the case for Peter. You're still invited to the table. Jesus knew Judas was, a, was already in the process of selling him out and he still sat close enough with him to dip his hand in the bowl with him. So whether you are here today and you're like, man, me and Jesus are so tight right now. You're invited to the table or you're like, gosh, I'm honestly in the middle of selling Christ out. I've been trading my relationship with Christ for unfaithfulness, for adultery, for lust, for for being a liar, for being a thief. If that's you, the communion's for you too. Jesus just said, take this bread. And remember my body broken for you. Take this cup and remember my blood poured out for you. But he didn't say, not you, Judas.
So if you would, in a moment, on the right-hand side of these rows, please pick up the white bucket, and we're going to pass the communion out. Thanks for helping each other out. I know sometimes it's hard to get it across the whole gap. The true work of discipleship is that a surrendered heart, a heart surrendered to Christ, eventually transforms everything we do. So you're going to take communion on your own during this song whenever you feel like it's right for you. But this is what I want to challenge you to think about. Today, are you a little bit more focused on the actions than the surrender? Are you the Judas who's trying to close the gap between your heart and your actions through self-justification? If so, you're invited to the table. Christ wants to meet with you. Or maybe you're a little more like Peter and you're like, man, I've really been trying to love Jesus with all my heart, but it's just taking a long time to bleed out into my actions. Ask the Holy Spirit for conviction. He is faithful to show you what to do. So they're going to play a song on your own. Think about it, pray about it, ponder about it, ask about the condition of your heart. And whenever you're ready, you can receive the communion for yourself.